All right, let's get into this one. I'm joined by The Athletic's Tim Spears, also Andy Jones and Adrian Clark as well. Andy, let's start with you. 1-0 last night against Wolves. It doesn't feel like company's changing for anyone anytime soon. A stubbornness, I reckon. Are the supporters behind him, though? Largely, yes, they, they still are. I think he's got you know a lot of credits in the bank from from what he did last season, where he brought uh, you know excitement and the joy back to, to Turf Moor, which which hadn't been there for for a couple of seasons, which which culminated in in the relegation. And I think um, you know he was certainly the the five nil win against Sheffield Sheffield United yeah. definitely definitely helped a, you know grow that belief a little bit more. But um, you know they are they are still behind them. They do still believe that they're under. There is an, an element of understanding that, you know, this was a, a project and, and this wasn't going to be easy. And, and you look at the signs in the summer and there was a lot of youth and potential that, you know, needed to be to be brought in. And mm. I think it, it's one of them now, you know, barely have got to the point where they, they're now competing with, with teams and, and making sure that they're, they're in games constantly. But the problem is, is that, you know, like last night, individual mistakes rather than anything else have... Um, you know, letting them down. Okay, it did come from from trying to play off from the back, but I think you know every team in, in the world is gonna gonna make mistakes doing that. Um, and it's sort of something you have to accept, and it, it is part of the, the the philosophy and and the the bigger bigger picture thinking. I think to you know to to help create further down the line. Um, but I think the the frustration was, you know, yesterday that you know Burnley forced Wolves into an error, but didn't take the big chance that they had a couple of minutes earlier. And when Burnley made their head of themselves, Wolves did. And that, and that has been a little bit of a theme for Burnley this season is that when they've made errors and bad errors in their own half, trying to play football, they have been punished pretty much every time, it feels like. Yeah. Let's come to you, Tim. Um, Huang scoring again for Wolves. Um, you know, vital home win. Um, what did you, from a Wolves perspective, make of Burnley last, last night? Uh, I mean, okay, but limited. Um, I mean, I read Andy's piece this morning and he said they need to be smarter. And yeah, I thought the same in August when I saw Andy uh, to cover the Burnley v Spurs game. (laughs) And um, they were incredibly naive that day. Like playing a high line against Son Heung-min was just ridiculous. I remember us talking about it, Andy, at the time. Um, so I'm glad from a, from a Wolves fan's point of view, I'm glad they've still got that naivety because last night uh, they basically g- gifted Wolves the game. I mean, w- Wolves are a team that sort of, you know, can need to rely on um, like intensity and pace and momentum and like moments mm-hmm. in games to like grab the game by the scruff of the neck, like like the last few minutes against Spurs when they just took, took all that intensity and momentum and just ran with it and won the game. And last night was really flat. I mean, there was nothing going on. It was really quiet. And Wolves were not there for the taking, but it was a really good opportunity for Burnley to go go and get something. And instead, they've gifted Wolves a goal. And um, and yeah, Wolves are very good at pressing in those situations. Mario Lamina does that a lot. And it was him that forced the error. So not really hugely surprised by what I saw. Just kind of, yeah, not on the night, very pleased that Burnley were the way they were. But it's frustrating to see a team continually make these same mistakes week after week, really. Yeah, I guess different fortunes for, for both teams. Wolves currently 12th now and obviously Burnley rock bottom in, in the Premier League at this moment. Um, let, let's bring it to O'Neill, Gary O'Neill as well. Um, how how do Wolf, how Wolf fans taking to him this season? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. Um, like perception is everything really. Um, O'Neill kind of came in obviously like last minute and probably seen by a lot of people as, well, he's the only guy around, right? I mean, it's August the... August the 10th or whatever, uh, every good manager's in post um, and there weren't many options around. From his point of view, I mean, he was dealt such a bad hand. The guy had no pre-season. Wolves had a fire sale in the summer and had to make almost 100 million quid. You know, Neves has gone the man for the past few years. Nunes goes right at the end of the window. They, it was a real era change in the summer. They lost Cody, Matinho, Traore, Jimenez, like massive players for the last few years, all gone in the summer. Nathan Collins went, very good, very good youngest centre back. And Wolves have had to make almost 100 million. Gary O'Neill comes in with no pre season. In his first five games, he's got Man United, Brighton, and Liverpool, all of which they lose. Um, and then he has sort of a difficult game at Luton where they, where they played 10 men with 60 minutes and draw. And all of a sudden, online, I'm seeing this guy's a PE teacher who's got to go. And <laughs> it's like, and like, it. it Last season, you know, you had Julian Lopetegui, obviously comes from 
uh, previously managing Spain and Real Madrid and Sevilla, and they're getting absolutely smashed six 0 at Brighton, and it's it's the owner's fault for not investing, and it's not you know the sort of general feeling is oh, it can't be Julian Lopetegui's fault. He's top level manager. Whereas when Gary O'Neill, despite everything that's gone on in the summer, making almost 100 million quid's worth of net sales and all the problems he's had, it's like it's it's his fault, not the owners. So it's really interesting to see that contrast. Um, I'm really pleased with Gary O'Neill that he sort of turned it round. Um, I mean, he only had to beat Man City and Spurs to do that. Um, <laughs> and like, you know, and then he's done this appearance on Monday Night Football, which really does seem to have changed people's perceptions. I know a, a lot of people seem to watch it that night and there's been a lot of clips circulating online. And people are like, oh, actually, yeah, he has got something to him. Maybe he can set up a team. Maybe he can coach players. I'd imagine this is all hugely frustrating for him to have to deal with. But he's at the start of his career. He's still he's still finding his path. And yeah, he has he has won the round for now. But I just know that a couple of defeats and it'll be the same again. Because it's, yeah, Gary, it's Gary O'Neill sacked by Bournemouth in the summer with not much of a managerial history. You know what I mean? Exactly that. And I know we sort of started on, on Vincent Company, but I just want to point out that even from a Wolves perspective, I mean, you've been unlucky as well this season. I mean, the game against Manchester United, <laughs> that, that yeah. unfortunately, you know, you've got to look at those kind of games and think, do you know what? Actually, put on a good show there and we could have come away with something a bit more. And that's just the nature of football, unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah, uh, we've yeah we've only been going a few minutes, but you've already got me thinking about VAR, which is really <laughs> God's sake. Because <laughs> I mean that's I mean that's we've talked about all the things with like player sales and new manager coming in, but VAR has had a massive impact on Wolves' mm. season. But I could talk to you about that for an hour. Let's let's not get into it. All right, let, let's <laughs> let's bring Adrian in. Come on, let, let's get you in the middle, right? Um, look, you know what 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 is fascinating is I started this saying, you know, obviously um, there's a there's a stubbornness to visit company. I mean, serial winner um, before his managerial career is clearly an incredibly intelligent human there and um, behind uh, the scenes. Mm. But if I'm thinking of any great manager, Poch, Klopp. Uh, Guardiola, Arteta even to this point I know you've got that sort of Arsenal hat on mm. you've got to kind of stick to your philosophy and just see how it plays out surely Yeah I admire it, I really do I think that, that modern day coaches and modern day players actually expect tactical clarity, they don't want too many blurred lines, how do we play, this is what we do let's do this the best that we can the best that we can do, now I think so, so I don't, I don't blame Vincent Company for for sticking to the the style of play that got them promoted from the championship because it was extraordinary. It worked amazingly well, and his whole recruitment policy was built around that style of football. So, coming into the Premier League, I do, I do get why he would stick to that. It, it makes sense to me. That the issue is, has he got the players that are good enough to play that way at the highest level in the top flight? And I think that is the big mistake that that he has made. And in and in the interim period, I think he's doing what most coaches would do, and and he's basically coaching the players. He's trying to get them to be better at their decision making, at their positioning, you know, at this style of play, so that when he can dip his toe into the transfer market again, you know, they're they're in a better place as as a team. But ultimately, he needs better players, in my opinion. I admire. The, the modern coaches that, that have the same philosophy. You've always got to have a plan B, a little bit of a willingness to adapt in game. You know, can we go to a back five? Well, tell that, tell that to Posta Coglu. Tell yeah, that well, to Posta Coglu. I know. He, he, he doesn't, he's not interested, is he, in that? I, I, my preference, <laughs> if he was my coach uh, of my team, I would prefer a little bit of adaptability. Um, but yeah, it's, it is what it is. And, and these are strong, strong characters, aren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, uh, Adrian makes a really good point there in terms of the personnel on, on, on the team. Um, and I think company even spoke about it. I don't know if he was alluding to maybe the owners dipping into their pocket to get bit, you know, a bit more money um, up front. But, you know, he said, you know, Wolves have got a very expensive striker and you can see what's happening there. Um, are you surprised um, by where this team is? Or do you think, personnel is needed or is it the philosophy that's the problem i mean where do we sort of put this jigsaw together yeah it's i, I don't i don't think that the philosophy is the problem because i think Burnley showed last season you know how when it does work how well it can work um i think so 
it was it's interesting really because I think there was there was an expectation that it was going to take time to blend, and I think when you've brought in fifteen new players, okay, two of them were already here because they were loan mm. tenants to permanents a year after bringing sixteen players in. That's a lot of new players, um, and company um, in the the documentary that Burnley did. Um, the mission mission to Burnley talked about how he feels his players need. I think it's a hundred training sessions and one hundred and twenty meetings, mm. um, which takes a long time <laughs> when you think about it. Um, you know that's sort of you know going on three months basically, and and obviously those players came in at different times. And Burnley had a basically had a two year promotion plan and did it in one. So we're already ahead of their own schedule and then felt mm. that the players that they had were particularly equipped for the Premier League or certainly needed some more help and then brought in more. The problem is is that a lot of those players were also lacking in Premier League experience, um, you know, young, high potential players, barely believe, but, you know, we're going to need developing. And, you know, Company's the type of manager who's, who never leaves the training ground, basically, and, and he's... He's put in a lot of lot of work behind the scenes to try and speed that process up. Um, but there is only so much you can do, and only so much these these players can learn in in a certain period of time. So I think I think it's a it's it's sort of a combination of of everything, um, really. But I think it's and that, and that's why there's there is a bit of a growing frustration among the fan base in terms of some of the tactics, the selections, the the substitutions. Even there's there, there are frustrations growing, but that's always going to be there when when your team's not winning, I guess. Um, but I think yeah, I think there's been a little bit of a disappointment. I think fans thought they were going to, you know, maybe not take the Premier League by storm because I think that's mm. that's saying that, you know they were going to come in and and show everyone who's boss type thing. But there was an element of you know we're going to be able to go and attack the Premier League, and that hasn't happened. Um, and it's sort of a culmination of players not quite being ready, um, you know, feeling a little bit undercooked, really, if you like, um, and maybe maybe too many changes because he has gone away from a fair few of the players who were, you know, his best players in the Championship, the likes of Zorori, Benson's been injured, didn't bring back Teller, didn't bring back Matson, which, you know, it went went other ways because of cost. And, and that Premier League experience, really, that, that nous, you know, that naivety Tim, Tim mentioned about has been on display. Mm-hmm. And, and then while they have made the steps in the right direction, performances are now in a better place than they were when... Tim saw me in there uh, in pieces <laughs> when <Tottenham laughs> and, uh, we're, we're ripping barely apart in that second half. There's a lot more sort of you can see the progress they've made, but until they, they make those final steps, they still haven't beat a Premier League team from last year. The two teams mm-hmm. they've beaten, they finished above last season. So even that sort of shows that they've they still make bridging that gap, which is is looking bigger than I think was hoped, and especially when you spent ninety million pounds. Yeah, the teams are, are only as good as their strikers, they say, don't they? And and the truth is, obviously, with La Foster out, they don't really have have a striker of, of no at Premier League level. Obviously, Amdouni's trying to do a job up there. I see him more as an attacking midfielder, really. Jay Rodriguez is is a is an experienced player, one of very few at Burnley, but but is he the answer? You know, at Premier League level, I'm not I'm not quite sure. And then you look at the other end of the pitch, and I think he took a real gamble. With James Trafford, who who is clearly a very talented boy, excellent shot stopper, but but you know dipping a youngster into the Premier League at his age is a risk, especially in front of a back four that that is sorely lacking in in Premier League mm. experience as well. So at both ends of the pitch, Burnley um, look weak to me. So. It's not a surprise to see them where they are in the division. I don't think there's anything wrong with the coaching. I don't think there's anything really wrong with the philosophy. I just think that the the, the makeup of his squad isn't right and it isn't good enough mm-hmm. at the moment to to give Burnley the the platform to go and play the football that that company knows he wants to produce. Yeah, Andy, I want to talk to you about something in a second, but I just want to bring Tim in here super quick and a little discussion we had before this pod sort of, we we, we started recording this pod was, does, does the name Vincent Company, Manchester City icon, Premier League icon, buy him a bit more time than Heckenbottom, for instance, you know, um, in terms of prestige, in terms of let's see where this goes. And, you know, if, if Burnley are overcooked um, and they are one year ahead of themselves, I mean, him going back down, 
to the championship isn't the worst thing in the world with his kind of experience. Yeah, um, I think I think his name certainly probably helps with fans, but I think more the job he did last season is is um, but buys him plenty of time. I, th- I mean, the, the game at the weekend was really interesting. You know, if Sheffield United completely folded, right? I mean, obviously, obviously Burnley did well to take advantage, but it felt like that's the perfect time to play Sheffield United. Mm. I mean, some of the stuff <laughs> they're doing was, was embarrassing, like mm. like like not even basics of like running and kicking footballs, you know, like real like basic <laughs> stuff. So I don't know. I just I felt like that kind of delayed a potentially really difficult decision for Burnley. You know, what, what, what are they looking to do here? Relegation looks likely, mm. you have to say. Um, okay, Everton. The Everton situation has changed things slightly for people, but on Everton's form, they should still stay up fairly comfortably. So, what do what do Burnley do here? Are they are they looking to uh, a bit of a Norwich situation where you know they'll, they'll they'll bank the money, they'll be stronger next season, they'll maybe come back up again. But also from Vincent Company's point of view, I think it's a really interesting dilemma. His reputation suffers by the week if this if this continues. And there's a situation here where I mean Burnley's next game is is Brighton away, and then they've got this huge two pressure games against Everton and Fulham. And the recent West Ham game showed that they don't handle pressure very well when they sort of folded at the end and, and lost lost two goals. And then after that, over Christmas, it's it's Liverpool and Villa. So the situation at the since at the end of December where Burnley look absolutely potentially could could have drift and gone. So what does company do then? Does he suffer for the next six months with a team that's going down and his reputation really takes a hit? You know, he was being touted with the Spurs job in the summer yeah. and talked about as a as a as oh he he's bound to take over from Guardiola one day at Man City. So <laughs> I mean so, quite a few people in that in that net. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think it's a really interesting question for him, you know, how does he envisage his career going from here as well because obviously this is the first time it's really taken a hit and Burnley aren't the most fashionable club and even if he gets them back up next season assume they get relegated you know he wouldn't get as much credit for that either so I don't know really difficult really interesting questions for Burnley and company to to ponder if this continues. Andy um, you say Burnley are maybe a year ahead of themselves at this moment in time is there a thought that let's safeguard what we've got that there's a high likelihood we're going to get relegated or, or are Burnley the kind of club that are living in, in the land of wonderful dreams and thinking, do you know what? We've still got a chance here at staying up in the Premier League. I'm just being very honest. Like how, how is the club run? Um, are they thinking financially? Do you know what? Great journey. Potentially. Um, we might be, are we safeguarding ourselves for, for, for getting relegated? I, th- I think they, there's still a belief that, that this team can stay up and I think the Everton point deduction does help because it did bring a team you know, back into the fold where it was looking like the three you know, promoted teams were, were going to get cut adrift basically even as early as you know, sort of nine, ten games in. Um, I think the, the, the massive spend in, in, in the summer makes me think that the, there's not going to be a massive amount of money to spend in January anyway mm-hmm. and that you know they may have just you know tried to put everything into that um and you know my my trezor is was a loan that's going to become permanent in, in, you know next summer anyway um so you're already looking at sort of an outlay of over 10 million pounds for for someone um but i think i think what what company continues to say is that there is there is still a belief and he still sees in his players and and i think it's fair because i think i think Sheffield United are a bit of pretty decent comparison in that barely have never you know, in this in this run, even when things have been going wrong, when when you know things have gone against them, the heads haven't dropped. They've not completely given up. It doesn't doesn't look like they're not no longer playing for company. There's still a there's still a togetherness there. There's still a, a let's play to the plan. Let's keep going. Let's let's keep doing what we're being told to do. And you know, hope, you know, eventually we'll. <laughs> you would like to think we'll get our rewards. Um, and it's what company's sort of been preaching recently is that the performance have, have been there, but they've not quite got the re- rewards in in terms of the results and. You know, you, you, they could be they could be sat on a, a really good, but yeah, decent points total if if they don't make silly errors uh, or crumble. Basically, the Palace game a couple of you know a couple of weeks ago was very very similar in that Palace didn't do anything but won the game, and Wolves didn't really do anything and won the game against Burnley. Um, and then you know you look at the West Ham game, and that was just one of those where as soon as it went one one, you sort of had that feeling it was going to go two one. Um, but I think I, I, I do genuinely think that. They were expecting the struggle, maybe not. I, I think I, in a piece I wrote, I think that they thought it was going to be, you know, speed bumps. But it, in a, in effect, it's been a massive pothole um, in in the way that they've sort the season's gone. Um, I don't think they, they expected it to be this 
this tricky. Um, but I think there was an expectation that these first few months were going to be tough. Um, and I, I think the hope is that the second se- the second half of the season is when you see them really, you know, those players who've taken the six months to adapt really explode onto the scene. But that's the difficulty. Is it, it's it's all sort of question marks, and I'm, I'm sure they'll be looking in, in in the window to try and add because you, you look at the, their options up front last night. Jay Rodriguez was the only they didn't have anyone on, on the bench to bring on. Michael Oberfemi was was left out of the squad, and and obviously Lafos is a blow because of. Sort of the company signings, um, he'd looked the most Premier League ready and Premier League. You know, he was he was there. He was scoring goals. You know, providing assists and creating a lot of problems. So, so that's been a massive, massive miss. Um, but I think they they will continue to. But it, it, company always says that they they look at every single option and company's so involved in the club at, at every level. Um, you know, he's he's involved in these boardroom discussions of of the finances and he knows everything that's going on. Um, so he will, you know, they're not, they're being sensible. You know, there was a lot of doomsday when they went down, um, you know, a couple of seasons ago about the, the loan that they had to repay and, um, you know, all the players being out of contract. And But, you know, internally, there wasn't that panic that, that there was externally because there was a, a belief that they'd sell a couple of players and be able to reinforce and, and the loan payments would be paid off. And, and that was the case. And they've come up, you know, in a strong and, and healthy financial position. Um They've spent money, but I think that you know that there is the element of safeguarding going on, whilst also being confident that they can still have a good go at, at staying up in the Premier League. And and if they go down, you know, I I, I referenced the Sean Dyche and Burnley being a perfect example of what happens if a manager comes up, gets that first taste of Premier League experience, goes down, comes back up, and then look what Sean Dyche and Burnley did in their, their second spell in the Premier League. Um, you know, even got into Europe, a couple of top ten finishes. So, I think if Benny looking at a model of why not to panic, that they themselves in a way are are the perfect model. Mm-hmm. Adrian, I'm just thinking about um, this sort of in terms of results, and you know, Eric Ten Hag. I mean, I don't know how true anything is in that respect because it feels like Manchester United has just been thrown everywhere, left, right, and centre yeah. at this moment in time. But there's conversations around people losing faith in his philosophy, and you know that losing the dressing room and mm. stuff like that. If you don't get a good succession of short-term results, does that play havoc with player confidence in terms of manager philosophy as well? Um, it depends on the group. I think if you've got a good group of players that are very united, um, that were primarily signed by that manager with, with that philosophy in mind. And I don't think short-term poor results will derail, derail that. Um, you've also got to look back at the body of work that company has produced at Burnley. If, we, if we're turning it back to Burnley, there, there is absolutely no reason for any of the players there to, to lose faith with the style of football that they're producing because Burnley enjoyed one of the greatest seasons in their entire history under Vincent Company last season. I know that Pep Guardiola won the treble, but in a sense, Vincent Company was the best manager in English football because he inherited a team that had very few players left. He inherited a, you know, a style of football that was polar opposite to the one he wanted to implement. He'd lost Nick Pope. He'd lost Tarkovsky. He'd lost me. He'd lost Dwight McNeil and others. <laughs> And they won the league at a canter and they won it playing the best football any Burnley fans have seen at Turf Moor since the 50s or 60s. <laughs> you know, so it's, I think he's got plenty of money in the bank, you know, um, and, and, and the, the players will stick with it. I'm confident. And, and I think Burnley yeah. should stick with him. I really do. He just, mm. what he needs to do, in my opinion, and this is where, this is from a player's head. If players continue to make the same mistakes, okay, we're seeing fullbacks coming into midfield, being robbed, other teams score, central midfielders being caught in possession and, 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 and turnovers turning into goals. If this keeps happening, you have to have accountability and players are totally okay with that. Um, it's when managers kind of ignore it and, and they just say, well, it's, it's down to me, it's down to me, it's down to me. And, 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 and how do the players learn then? I think sometimes you've got to be maybe a little bit more ruthless with the players if they continue to make the same mistakes. And and maybe in the transfer market in January, he he needs to be, yeah, very cold-blooded, I would suggest, Vincent Company, in regards to who, who he goes out and gets. Because he needs to get better players to play the football that he wants to 
implementing the Premier League. Uh, Tim, this is makes me think of what you said earlier about what he does next, really. Um, is there a potential that he's thinking of his next job? I mean, we don't know what's in his head, but if you don't, you know, we know the kind of football he wants to play. He's going to need a bit of backing uh, financially for that. He probably might not get that at Burnley. I mean, it's just a natural kind of feeling of like, you know, someone who's ambitious, right? Like, what's next? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if he's dropping hints about January, then that, that suggests he feels like he needs that investment. And yeah, where, where does he go next? Uh, it's it's really interesting to see. And the next few months will define that, I think. I really think if they have a really tough time and they're sort of root, rooted near the bottom of the table and maybe Sheffield United get a bump from Chris Wilder and if, if Burnley's struggling in last place, that was really going to hinder his reputation. Um, I'm not saying he should walk away from that, but it is but it is an interesting thing for him because he pl- he'll be plotting his his career path. You know, we all do that when we're on Football Manager, right? Well, well <laughs> where's... If only I had the time, Tim. But yeah, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're like, oh, who's who's vulnerable? Who might get the chop at the end of the season? You know, where, where, might, where might I fit in? Um, so, yeah, and he's he's obviously, he's getting he's getting a good ground in and electing Burnley. Um, been manager for three years now. And he obviously has a philosophy and clearly has football intelligence. We've seen that for many, many years that can really impress owners and fans and players. And um, I hope it works out for him. It's, but the, the next few months are, are obviously going to be the toughest of, of his career. And I just hope he sticks to his guns mm. and um, comes through at the other side. I think we'll, we'll want him to succeed. He's, like, he's a very likeable guy. Yeah, I, th- I think it is fair to reflect that on uh, just on the financial thing that mm. Bailey's Bailey spend in the summer was was pretty astronomical for them, um, and it, he's he's very central to that. Um, so, you know that he, he, <laughs> to say he's sort of sending a message to the board, he has to sort of take accountability for that because mm. Bailey did spend ninety million ish net. You know, they only bought in a couple of million pound on players, so they they did back him. And and he is very very central to, um, I think Pace called him as you know the number one salesman at the club, and a lot of the players are there for him. So, yeah. you know, he takes a lot of responsibility with that. Um, so it is a little bit interesting, but I think there was always a plan to do to do something in January. Um, it's just how much money is available. Um, but equally, you know, company was was a big part in, in bringing the players in that are there. Yeah. Um, so he also has to. Um, you know, take take accountability on that that apart to, and, that part to to being the person who needs to to get them up to the levels and the standards because that's the task that he technically took on by mm. signing those players. Andy, the, the I think he had a genius transfer policy or recruitment last season in the championship. You know, he signed a bunch of players most of us had never heard of. They took the championship by storm. They were swashbuckling. and they were sensational. He's had a shocker of a window in the summer, hasn't he? I mean, those players don't it's, look an they don't look an upgrade on the players that they had in the championship. Not a big enough upgrade, anyway. Not, not, and, and as you referenced earlier, so many changes to a side that were completely at ease with that style of football, and now he's had to start again in the big league, where obviously it's going to be a lot a lot tougher. I just, I'm just thinking about what Tim said about his managerial career. You know, it's a crossroads moment. It feels like one bad transfer window from Vincent Company can undo a body of work that was that was unreal. Let's be honest. Last year, yeah, it's, we, were, we it's, all it's, thought he was really sensational. Yeah, it, it is really interesting, and because you do go through the list of players, and you know, Bayer was was already there, so you know, has, has been you know as good as you would expect, and a young centre back and has had injury problems, so he's still not quite got got up to speed. Um, but you, you look at you go through the list and, and you would only say Luca Cogliosho, Zeki Anduni, and in more recent weeks, I know he makes the mistake against Wolves, but Sander Berg has have, have really stood up and, and and really shown, you know, looked sort of the, the part. And I think I think James Stafford is probably coming for a bit of unfair criticism at times. Um I don't think he's been anywhere near the main problem. Um, you know, he's he, there's elements of his game which which need to be better and could be better. Um but I don't think he's like a, a massive you know, sticking out to someone that was an awful mm. buy, if if you like. Um, but yeah, you are right. It's, I I do sort of come back to and think, you know, instead of fifteen, could they have bought, you know, six players for fifteen million, which would have been roughly the same 
you know, outlay or something like that, or, you know, five players for, for 20 million, um, you know, a bit more experience, maybe a little bit more wage. Yes. Okay. But all in all, you know, the costs probably work out pretty similar and, and could they, you know, could those six players have made more of an impact than, than some of the players who, you know, to be, to be frank, are struggling to even make the squad at times. Um, that, that's the thing. And, you know, uh, you know, company, I think you referenced in the summer that some of these players, they'll, they'll have moments during the season where they'll be the ones to stand out. But it's, I think you described them as Easter eggs, but I hope it doesn't take until Easter for, for a lot of them to sort of show themselves because that will be too late. And unfortunately, so far, there's not been enough of them who, who have stood up. And, and interestingly, the one who has was, you know, a two and a half million pound signing from the league who played 75 minutes of first team football, which mm. was pretty incredible that he's been the best of of what they've signed. Okay, let's uh, let's move this forward. And actually, by moving forward, we sort of need to go back a little bit. And I just, especially people that don't watch the championship, very quickly, Andy, how big an achievement was the job that company did last season at Burnley? Adrian's alluded to, yeah. to the brilliance of it, but just for people who don't get it, how big a job was that? Huge. Um, he entered the club, which was was on the knees really after you know a really disappointing season, couple of seasons. You know, relegation. The mood was really flat among the fan base um, because of the worries about the finances and stuff. And I think he, when he walks in the door, there's, there's ten senior players, give or take one or two maybe, that he's got to work with um, because of the amount he's left. And and that includes in those numbers some of the ones that then went on to sell, like the you know Corne McNeil. Etc. So he had a massive rebuilding job, and you know, as, as Adrian said, not only to bring the, the players in, the right players in, but to, to completely change the style into his image. And he also had a shortened preseason because of the World Cup, um, you know, in the mid season. So it was a shortened preseason. He was, you know, brought, bringing in 16 new players, trying to bed them all in. Everyone teaches style, uh, teach everyone his style, and it was it was just incredible that first day of the season, just how quickly it clicked. Um, and I think that was a, a massive moment because it gave everyone belief in the dressing room that and everyone had already seen his, you know, his quality. There had been a lot of, of talk um, about, you know, how impressive he'd been in training sessions and, and his level of detail, which, you know, you were, you were talking to some of the, the senior pros like Jay Rodriguez, Johan Goodmanson throughout the season who were like, we're learning things we'd never knew. And these are, mm. these are players with, you know, 10 plus years in, in professional football and, you know that that was impressive in the way he improved players and and took you know unknown players from 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 different you know various places you know lesser known clubs if you like and and just turned them into you know brilliant players basically in, in that league and and then it was the you know the style of football having the sixty percent possession you know creative attacking dominating teams um, it was just so impressive scoring loads of goals you know keeping a lot of clean sheets um, to do it in such a short space of time and then. And then, yeah, to, to to just basically sweep everyone aside and then to, to end it with winning it at your local rivals, I don't think anyone could have scripted a better season than what it became. Um, and and it, a lot of that was down to company and, and the way he worked and the way he went about it, you know, the, the 12 to 14 hour days, the the relentlessness of how he drilled his, you know, the, you know his philosophy into the team, the team meetings that were every day. Um, you know the really detailed sessions that that he put on. You know every 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 blade of gra- grass was covered in in terms of preparation for every single team. And and I don't think that's changed this season. The difference is now that they are playing the best of the best, and and that has been the the big step up. And that's what they've not been able to to deal with with a with a, a group of players who who aren't quite used to used to the level. Um, but yeah, last season was was super impressive because. Even there were, were there even doubts about company. He'd never, you know, he hadn't been in the championship before. Didn't know the league. Admitted he didn't know the league. Um, so was learning on the job himself. And um, you know, for for every everything to come together the way it did was just fairy tale like in a way. Yeah, and Adrian, I mean, like 
huge culture shift as well if you think about it uh sean deitch vincent company very different kind of personalities there's actually a pub in burnley i've been to a couple of times the royal deitch what a pub that is um <laughs> okay. with sean deitch's face right up there yeah it's amazing uh are we at the point where the royal deitch might start calling itself the royal company based on <laughs> I mean, last that, season's nice... obliteration of the championship yeah it was it was seriously I think that impressive. was an april fool's joke <laughs> it was what was that, i think it was an april fool's joke that he did I think the, uh, oh, they did it. All right, they did. did yeah. I think they did. Good. I think it was an April Fool's joke that they did. It's got, <laughs> it's got a nice ring to it. Um, but yeah, um, the, uh, he he is a, he's clearly a very good coach. I think he's got the stature. I think he's got the aura to be a Premier League manager. Um, and and as I said at the outset, I admire him sticking to his principles here. So yeah, I, I mm. think I think Vincent Company is going to have a successful management career. But this is a massive test. He's made some mistakes, I think, in the transfer window, left himself short of quality and Premier League experience. And it this is this is the acid test, I think, of his coaching credentials. Can he can he get this group of players up to the level required? And and I'm seeing signs that he might be able to do that. But the problem is you can be competitive, you can play your, your good football, but if you can't score enough goals. Um, at the other end, at the top end of the pitch, it's it's going to be hard to win enough matches to survive. So they they desperately need a goal getter, and I think once they get one, the second half of the season will be much better for Burnley. Mm. And Tim, I know you've kept an eye on Spurs as well, and um, Ange. Um, <laughs> any, any similarities we can see in, in in that stubbornness? Any similarities we can see in sticking to a philosophy? But I guess perhaps different that he might be able to adapt his philosophy as well. Cause I know he definitely did when he was at Anderlecht, uh, Vincent company. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sticking to your guns and your philosophy is it's admirable, but it's got to work, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we can all say, yeah, Poster Cogley should definitely not sacrifice his principles. Well, yeah, you know, they went unbeaten for the first 10 matches of the season. So we, we can see that, that it does work. Right. And it showed huge signs of promise and they've just got this horrendous injury record, but there have to be wins and results and positivity, Otherwise, you, you can say all you want that yeah, the, oh, the players will lose respect if you if you if you change your philosophy. But also, if, if it's not working, the players will be like, well, why the hell are we but still? What would you doing change? What would you week change him? Because because like it, it, it's really only overplaying, isn't it? In, in inside your own half, is that the only thing you would you ch- you could change? That would be the main one for me. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I've only sort of seen a couple of full Burnley games this season, but that would certainly be the one that sticks out every time. Is overplaying at the back. Um, you know, people question whether Spurs should be doing it, and that's you know Spurs with gifted centre halves who could play up front. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, the the, the Poster Cogley thing. I mean, he's he's an extreme example, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> look what he did at, at City. I mean, he, I mean, the City one was just genius. Oh, it was insane. Golly. But he's like, but, but you know, when you listen to him, I, I can see why the he, the, he, the players are inspired by him. I mean, he was asked on mm-hmm. Friday, Poster Cogley pre City. Um, by a couple of journalists in the room, they were like, okay, so you've got 11 players out and, and uh, you've lost three on the spin and it's Man City away at the weekend. Like, Surely, you, you know, might go a bit defensive. And he was so offended. He was like, he was mate. like, you know, well, obviously, you, yeah, you want me. Um, but he, no, but he literally, he literally was like, what? Like, what? he turned around, he was like, what, what do you think? What do you think I'm going to say here, honestly? What, what what do you expect me to say here? Do you think I'm going to go defensive? I mean, come on. He was like, he, so, but he but he made the point. He was like, I was hired to do this job, this specific mm. job that I'm trying to do. This is what I was hired for. So, a company might say exactly the same. And Post Cogner makes the point that the best clubs, they have a plan, they invest in that plan, and then they stick with that plan. And that might be hard when results aren't going well. But you know, these things can take time. So. Um, you hope that Burnley do the same and that it works. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's uh, Eric Ten Hag's Eric Ten Hag's kind of point of view is that he's got his idea, and we just need to weather the storm in many respects. Um, I guess the. Fi- <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just really trying to be sympathetic to Man United fans. Honestly, uh, we're still waiting. Anyway. Uh, Quick one, Andy. I mean, look, fixtures, it's that time of year, isn't it? Fixtures are coming thick and fast and you're looking at a team that needs to pick up points. I mean, is there even any time to tweak? Is there even any time to make this work? Because how do you get back 
on form, you know. I mean, Sheffield United was a, an anomaly, I guess, in many respects in terms of the scoreline, but Burnley need to get back to winning ways. They do. Um, they do. It, it, it is difficult because I think company does does cherish that time on the training pitch. And I think you know, even even like back to last season, that World Cup break that, that they had was a massive massive help in, in sort of getting that getting his you know his views and his, his thoughts across and, and then you saw the I think that was when they, they came back after that and basically went on a, a ten game win and run. Um don't think they're quite gonna be able to do that in the in the Premier League. Um mm. but yeah that's this but this is where you know this, I think this month is a massive definition of the season really. Um this is where you've got to pick your points up. Um and I think what company has compromised he's, he's made little tweaks without going away from the, the main plan um and i think that is why Burnley have got to the point they've got to if they were still playing like they were playing in the first few games they would be you know cut adrift probably or, or certainly continuing to lose games you know comfortably um and because a lot of the games you know at the start of the season they were out of it by the hour mark um now they're getting into the, a place where they're at least in the game all the way to the end. Um, sometimes in the lead, sometimes you know trying to trying to get it find an equaliser or um, you know trying to avoid the defeat. Um, so I think it's 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 it, it, it is difficult at this time of year to make the tweaks. But I think also you know they are in a place where I think they've they're beginning to find the formula that that is working. And I think that it's shown in companies' lineups. There was a lot of changes, a lot of a lot of personnel swaps in and out three, four changes every week where he's now he's now basically got a core 10, core 9 or 10 that he's played in the last five games. And I think that's showing the, the level of where he's getting to, where he's beginning to to believe that his players are able to, to and capable of doing of doing the jobs he wants them to. Um, but yeah, it's equally on the same pitch, you can't really, you know, you can't really plan for bad passes and bad touches in your own area. And you can't plan for, you know, you know, needing someone to just tuck, tuck the ball in the bottom corner when they get the chance, which you know was basically last night. <laughs> I think, I think with with company in general, there, there is an interesting debate about whether players who've been to the top of the game and players and players who are big names and famous names, you know, should be deserving of those mm. Premier League jobs and getting those top jobs. I mean, you know, Lampard, Gerrard, Rooney yeah. would be the most obvious current example. I mean, you know, I I I find it remarkable that. Um, that he got that job, to be honest, and I, I don't have much confidence in it working out. And the fact that he, you know, what has he done in his managerial career to justify getting that job? And this is just sort of Birmingham in the middle of the championship. Um, mm. You know, he's taken them from 6th to 15th. And the guy who's now in 6th is Liam Rossinia, who's the one who got a lot of credit for the work that Rooney actually did at Derby when he just had that one season of sort of when they sort of scraped up. But you look at a club like Brighton, you know, they set the benchmark for what a managerial appointment is, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of a, a coach and a manager with a real philosophy and a playing style that's far, far more important than a name. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not sort of, I'm not talking necessarily about company in particular here, yeah. but it's an interesting point about how now players like company and, and Gerald and Lampard, these guys are like multi, multi millionaires, right? Yeah. How much do they want it? That they've they've gone to the very top of the game. The chances of them doing it again at management level are are not great. So they've achieved what the biggest thing they've already going to achieve in their career. How much do they want it? And and, and you know, like I said, they're multi multi millionaires. These guys. If a guy's forging his career like Roberto De Zerbi, I don't know. I, th- I think it's an interesting interesting debate to have. I wouldn't necessarily but, lump company in on that because he seems like a very studious, yeah. intelligent guy. But you, mm-hmm. uh, motivation certainly comes as part of it. I think. Yeah, but I mean, you could easily say that about Xabi Alonso at Leverkusen. Yeah, no, of course, yeah. He was sort of, you know, it was in Serie B for a little while and then he's come into Leverkusen with his philosophy. I know he's been back financially to a certain degree, but yeah. I mean, look at that. I, I, th- I, th- I think it's the Lampard, Gerrard and Rooney thing for me. is mm. like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll give this a go. We'll, we'll get a good job. We'll get the bloody, we'll get the Chelsea job. We'll get a big job at Villa, big job at Birmingham. You know, but how, how much do they really mm. want it? That's mm. what I would question. Football team, with football team. Being on that touchline in a full stadium with that buzz of needing to win. Honestly, it's like a drug. It's like a drug. Some people cannot let go of that. And I I love it. I love the fact. Mm. I think it shows you how much they want it. Because these guys really don't need it. They don't need the aggravation. Mm. They must love it. Um, Love the game. Love the the buzz of it. Um, And I don't think any of them are frightened of 
of you know what's around the corner. Uh, they're winners, aren't they? So yeah, I, I, I'm really pleased to see so many big name players that are, that are turned into management. I'm um, yeah, I think fair play mm. to them. Yeah, I mean, when you say what's around the corner, I mean, there's a pretty lucrative deal over in the Middle East if you really want it. I mean, just, just let you know if you fancy, if you fancy, uh, you know, a spin out there in the heat. Anyway, Adrian, Andy, very quickly, let's finish on this. And I know you've got your your Burnley hat on, a Burnley staying up on record. I'm going to put, we're going to record oh. this on record. Come on, son, <laughs> let me know. Um, I don't think so, just because I think the other teams who were in the Premier League last season have got too much. I, I do think mm. that, the three promoted teams are are unfortunately going to go back down. Um, mm. I, even with Everton's point of deduction, I just think Dyche has got them in a really, really good place. They remind me a lot of his best Burnley teams in a way of being able to just grind out the results. And, and their away form is so good that they're going to get the home form right eventually, I think. So, unfortunately, at the moment, um, and, you know, Burnley have gotten by a £40 million strike in January and I went because company asked for it, <laughs> which will change everything. But yeah, at the at the, at the current time, I think it's difficult to see Burnley surviving. Okay, fair enough. All right, let's end it there, gents. Uh, thank you, Tim, Andy and Adrian. Remember to rate and review the podcast if you're enjoying it. And why not give a friend or loved one the gift of The Athletic this holiday season, a one-year subscription. Thank you for listening. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, Search the Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts from.